I don't know, let's just get started. It's, it's just about, why yeah, why not? Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the embedded problem that I've been experiencing at Intel for the past few years working on the Intel phones. So Intel has multiple groups working on Linux and multiple groups working on Android. So I've been working on Android for the Intel phones that are uh, validated and and uh, go through regulatory certification and have actually been have actually shipped not necessarily in large volumes but have gone through the process <laughs> so um, this is an approximate outline of what I'm hoping to hoping to talk about introduce myself and then introduce the the topic go through the history the environment that I we work I have we have to we, we live in with respect to this uh, embedded problem uh, and uh, try to bring up uh, what are the key questions I should be trying to ask and then go and drop into uh, some of the techniques that I've been using to try to address the, the uh, problem with uh, various levels of success. Um, and then I want to I wanna end with uh, the proposal of moving, of keeping drivers that are not uh, upstreamed or <coughs> or aren't ready for even consider, consideration for upstreaming, um, keep them out. I'm, I'm proposing that to keep those things out of the kernel tree altogether um, for various reasons. <coughs> so I'm recommending out of tree modules. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working on Linux for you know, 10, 12-ish, 13 years, something like that and uh, Android since 2008. Um, so I'm, I'm a, my title is the Android Kernel Architect and that means I, I have some flexibility in picking and choosing what problems I feel are important and, and uh, uh, a little bit of leverage in getting uh, uh, managers who control headcount to uh, prioritize some of these problems where uh, otherwise I wouldn't get to do get anything done. Uh, so the things that I'm interested in working on these days is, is I really think I uh, I have a chance of addressing some of the embedded problem, which I'll define in the next slide. Um, and the other the other issues that other things that I I'm, I'm I'm working on include the scaling problem, which I talked about on Monday at the Android Builders Summit, which is how do we how do we support many. Uh, target devices within one build um, without, without collapsing our continuous integration process under the gravity of hard drives. Um, uh, try to get ahead of transitions that we see coming, you know, um, you know GPUs, uh, uh, just, just transitions in, in that like um, uh, m moving to ACPI 5, or from SFI or um, maybe even UEFI boot associated with uh, the phones. Um, I also get involved with uh, some, I do uh, code reviews. Um, uh, briefly, I should, I should, I should, I, I left it, I, I messed it in the slides, but um, the way our organization is set up is we have uh, this notion of feature teams and feature teams are basically uh, responsible for specific use cases. So, for example, we have a we have a wireless feature team that's responsible for the regulated spectrum. We have a uh, 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 a Wi-Fi feature team for the for the unregulated spectrum. We have an audio. We have a media. We have graphics. We have video. These are all. Uh, we have a power management and a thermal feature team. So each one of these feature teams they're responsible for the use cases from from top to bottom on the stack. So these guys come in and they, they have uh, ability to modify the kernel in the continuous integration process uh, without my blessing. And uh, so what we do is, you know, I, I try to do code reviews on what, what all these guys are doing, but it's, it's hard to keep up. So um, we, uh, I need to do more code reviews. Um, Another thing that I'm involved with is trying to mentor and teach the organization how to use the tools and, you know, the, some of the 
grease the skids for the next kernel migration and, and try to improve things. And uh, another thing I deal with is unplanned surprises like, like uh, the, uh, the CES demo of Bay Trail running Android, which wasn't a planned thing to deliver for 2013, is all of a sudden now we need to do Android on Bay Trail for 2013. <laughs> so it's like, ah. Um, so that's, that's basically me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so what is the embedded problem? Uh, basically, the embedded problem is when it takes significantly longer to harden a kernel uh, on, within a, a, uh, a software stack on a device than it takes for the Linux kernel community to go to new kernels, um, it becomes virtually impossible to upstream and there gets to be a large investment in inertia associated with staying on, on the older kernel. So the embedded problem is how, do, is how can we migrate to new kernels? And also missing from this, it, it, it also becomes, it, you stay on a kernel for a long time, it's hard to migrate to a new kernel. It's a lot of work and a lot of fear. Okay, so what makes it take so long in the first place? Well, you know, we're talking about new hardware. These are, you know, we're, I'm dealing with phones in this, in phones and tablets in this, in this context. And uh, so you got new boards, you got new, you got new silicon, you got new boards. We get new drivers, new use cases. You know, I mean, uh, you know, some the camera. Somebody needs a new use case for rapid fire picture taking or something like that, and then we that results in uh, significant code uh, flux. Um, and everything builds from bottom up. So you got the hardware, then you got the firmware has to be good enough so you can run a kernel. And the kernel has to be good enough so it can load the base OS and run that. And the HAL can sort of work. The middleware depends on the HAL and the kernel and then the OS stack. Finally, you can test your use cases. And then you start testing and then you find bugs. Yeah, and so bugs are found late and uh, that's just the way it is. Um, I'm not telling anyone here or anything new, but that's sometimes uh, needs to be spelled out a little bit. Uh, so I want to get this over right away. For, for us, um, we only have one motivation for moving to a new kernel, fundamentally, and um, we have customers that expect modern kernels uh, before to be, they expect the kernel that they go to uh, manufacturing with to be not older than a year and a half old when they start their high volume manufacturing. Um, so this means that uh, the 3.0 kernel is kind of too old today. So we need to be on the 3.4. Um, oh, and, and in the space I work in, um, the, the kernels that matter really are the long-term support kernels. Uh, so we're basically tracking that. Um, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, getting ready for the 3.9 kernel, uh, which Right now, that's the anticipated long, next long-term support. You know, because if it's not 3.9, then it's going to push out to somewhere like late July or August. It's, so we kind of expect it to be 3.9. Um, and uh, the other thing, so you know, I mean, one customer will push for one product, um, but you know, because our driver and integration teams and our continuous integration process is kind of cumbersome when it comes to branches and, and multiple kernel versions, um, you know, the teams can't handle it. And so if, if we have to move for one product or one, one target, you know, everyone has to move uh, to a new kernel. And uh, unless the device is in maintenance mode, then we don't move it. So uh, I'm just going to kind of go through here. This is kind of a rough history of what we've, what I've been involved with. So back in, uh, I don't know what year it was <laughs> anymore, <laughs> but back in the 2.6.31, 32 days, we uh, started Android on, on uh, Moorestown, and uh, basically we forked off the Moblin kernel at that point because they were they're doing Moblin at that time. And so we took, we took the Moblin kernel and we, and we put the, um, the uh, um, AOSP common Android patches on top of that baseline, and then we and, and then we started hardening that for, for Morristown. Um, we did do one production product with Morristown, the, uh, 
the uh, Cisco CS thing. Um, and then, um, then uh, Medfield showed up. So Medfield is the next generation chip. That's one of the current ones that are available today. And at that time, it was, you know, Moblin became MIGA. And um, so I did the exact same maneuver. I took the, I took the uh, MIGA kernel, and then I put the 2635 Android patches. Actually, I cherry-picked the, the 2635 Android patches on top of the MIGA kernel. And we stayed with that for Froyo and Gingerbread. And then um, uh, when ICS came out, we moved to uh, the 3.0 kernel. And uh, uh, these, um, there was about, I don't know, about 4,000 some patches in each one of these kernels um, over time. You know, it's just astounding how many changes keep getting put into these kernels on, on a, on a uh, hardened branches. I mean, you'd, you would think they would finish and just stop changing things. Uh, but, you know, the more they test, the more they find bugs, or they, the, longer, the longer you stay on a kernel, the more, the more feature creep, you know, will happen to that particular kernel. And, that, and um, so there, there tends to be a lot of thrash. Actually, camera is, one, is, is still a pretty active area where new features and use cases are driving uh, significant code flux for us. So anyway, for the 3.0 kernel, we had Medfield, Clover Trail, and uh, an SOC. I'm not sure I can say in public, but everybody knows its name. Um, and then there's um, currently we're migrating to uh, 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 3.4. Oh, and about this SOC that everyone knows its name. <laughs> uh, you know, we put it into the 3.0 kernel when it was uh, still uh, virtual. So at Intel, we tried to do, um, we have this shift left thing where we try to bring up uh, kernels and drivers on, on the virtual platform and emulators and, and whatnot. And so we have a virtual and a virtual hybrid target associated with SOC1 in the 3.0 kernel. And, you know, th this thing hasn't, you know, it just, it just recently powered on for real. Uh, like I think last last quarter, um, so um, I believe we, we we allowed that code to get into the integration kernel too soon, and that's one of the lessons that um, I didn't list at the end of the talk. But it's 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 something you should keep in mind. You should have entry criteria associated with allowing stuff into your continuous integration and your hardening branches, and it should include that the device is testable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, in real, as opposed to uh, virtual. Okay, so then, anyway, so now we're on to 3.4, and this is good. This is targeted for jelly bean and the K or dessert, and possibly the L dessert, depending on when it comes out. But uh, we've dropped Moorestown, as you can see, and uh, so it's Merrifield, Clover Trail, the Surprise Bay Trail, you know, SOC one. Um, and probably another couple of SOCs will be hosted in this, this particular kernel uh, before, before the end of this year, actually. Um, so that's kind of the history of the kernels. And so this is kind of the, I'm going to try to explain a little bit about the environment that, that we're living in associated with this, this embedded problem uh, on the SOCs. And, uh, so the way the device hardening happens is um, we have a single branch, we get a thousand people beating on it, and we get a lot of testing on it, and everything is merged and done in a continuous integration fashion. We use BuildBot for our infrastructure, for our continuous integration, uh, because uh, the team that we, we uh, acquired from Freescale in, in Toulouse is our integration team, and you know there's some BuildBot maintainers there. so they. Uh, they got the pick, <laughs> so we're using BuildBot, which isn't all that bad. But um, uh, so so the way it works is an engineer will do will do their development on their local workstation. They'll do their local testing, and then they'll upload it to Garrett using uh, the, the the Android Garrett thing. Uh, and then BuildBot will detect the upload. It will it will do a lint process. Um, to check, you know, do check patch on it and look for other things that are 
fairly easy to do. And then it will even do a compile test and, and an automated smoke test. And then this is all before the code review is actually done. So it'll, and then, so after the linting of the, of the uh, change, then, then it goes through a code review process uh, and, uh, and it needs to get, uh, you know, a plus two from, from the, the feature team maintainer, which I think is a conflict of interest that I recommend against allowing, uh, and of, of usually a domain expert of some sort. So it used to be that if you made a change to the kernel, the cur that change could not be merged unless I gave it a plus two on the review. Um, but I became the sole bottleneck for, you know, 500 people making kernel changes that uh, it, it, it became impractical. And uh, so uh, we, uh, uh, we added more testing. <laughs> That's what we ended up with. Um, so in practice, we see about 50 to 100 changes per week. Even, you know, it, it's fairly constant. I've, I've, it's always like 50 to 100. Um, and uh, and uh, it, it goes on for about two years. You know, one to two years, we keep beating on it. And uh, during this time, you'll find, you know, new features sneaking in, you know, like uh, uh, camera features or wide eye. That was a big party, uh, getting that integrated with Android. Um, and uh, also, we have about between 30 and 80 non-upstream drivers associated with each, each one of these targets. Uh, about half of those drivers are, are third-party reference drivers that are just kind of uh, hacked into place and made to work. And uh, um, we also make some changes to the core kernel and uh, also code that uh, is already upstream. So like some drivers that are upstream drivers will, will, will uh, tweak. Um, the management really doesn't care about upstream at all. Um, and uh, actually there, there is some bias against it because we had a hard time with the, the way Migo worked out. And so the uh, management and uh, program management kind of point to that a little bit and go, look, at, look, what, it, look what Upstream first did for you. you know? um, and uh, uh, so I have to deal with that. Uh, but there's a little prejudice there, but not a lot. Uh, but mostly there's, there's projects really aren't planned with, the, uh, with planning for the software effort uh, for new kernels. They, when you start a project, you assume a particular kernel, and the map when you map out the project planning, they tend to not even account for. Oh yeah, we, we're going to need to do a kernel rev somewhere in the middle of this project. They, you know, it's not on the it's not on the uh, Gantt charts. A lot of times, actually, most of the times. So moving a new kernel is only done under under duress, and we get that from a customer. Um, so this is more of the same. Um, you know, it, it, it's the, the attitude for new kernels, actually the, the managers of these feature teams, they're not paid. They're, they're measured on fixing bugs and adding features. They're not, they're not measured, they don't, they don't get paid for uh, upstream goodness. And, and in fact, many feature team, I've heard a few feature teams working, you know, tell me, look, we, we're not allowed to if we, if we want to spend time on any uh, new kernel stuff, we have to do it on our own nickel or on our own time. Um, and, uh, and, and which is really too bad. But to be fair, they really aren't, it would, it, it's somewhat irresponsible to let these feature teams upstream kernel code themselves because, you know, they may have time to do the upstream work today but next week, they will not. They'll be working on the next shiny thing, you know, or next version of whatever feature they're working on, and they won't be able to effectively address, you know, uh, interacting with the community. Um, so we need, we need to have that, a that activity is, is, get, is, is, is falling into responsibility of the kernel feature team. So we, we have, we've created a kernel feature team to deal with this. Uh, let's see, this is more of the same. I don't know if we need to say too much about this. Uh, the quality side effects of getting your code reviewed by upstream people is not seen as compelling 
with respect to um, the time to market pressures. So, uh, and also the upstream kernel isn't really, that code isn't getting tested where the old kernel, old code is getting tested fairly significantly. And uh, the, the, the motivation for doing upstream work at all is really to reduce the time to market for the kernel transitions. So it, it, becomes, it becomes a second order driver and it's, it's, a, it's, a, good, it's, a, it's a significant enough driver to um, give me headcount to support this activity. So it's, it's not like it's blown off and, it, and it's completely ignored, but it's not the feature team's responsibility. They don't, it's not, it's not part of their uh, embos, uh, managed by, management by objective. Um, so the other problem is uh, moving to a new kernel takes really longer than it should. Um, you know, we, we, we have an old, moldy old kernel with, you know, 4,000-ish patches to it. It would be nice to be able to move to a new kernel and be able to get the new kernel and have that transition done in such a way that we could start getting all the feature teams using a new kernel within like a couple weeks. And uh, it's not the way it works. You know, it, it takes a couple months, it seems like. Um, part of the reason why it takes so long is because we, the, the kernel feature team that's doing the work associated with migrating to a new kernel, um, we really want to clean up some of the sins of, of, of the uh, previous, previous kernels. And so we, 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 we spent extra time cleaning up the, the early board power on and, and the, the, the board files and, and uh, uh, the power management uh, implementations so that they're, they're, they're better than what they were before. But because we take time to do that, um, you know, the, there's, there's another 1,200 changes that sneak into the old kernel version underneath, you know, while we're working. And it becomes pretty hard to uh, account for uh, the bug fixes. And um, one of the biggest problems that, that, that uh, the management has with, with moving to new kernels is this, account, this accounting problem, or the auditing problem, as I call it here. And this is where um, we've invested millions of dollars in testing time, actually tens of millions of dollars in testing resources uh, to test this old kernel, and then we're moving to a new kernel. Is there any way we can quantify how many bugs are still fixed in the new kernel that were fixed in the old kernel? Um, are all the features there? Uh, and there, there really isn't a good way today to do that. You know, um, and uh, this is one of the problems I'm trying to solve this year, uh, is deal with that. Um, you know, and, and, and another point is, um, so on the 3.4 kernel, uh, 3.4 came out last late, late May, early June time frame, and uh, we had the 3.4 kernel booting on our, on our stack in, in August, actually in late July, and I was planning that, you know, in my mind, we were, it was a slam dunk and obvious we were going to move to the 3.4 kernel in September. You know, and we would, we would have it done, and we would harden it, and it'd be all good by by end of October, November. Um, but the program managers, they have, they have uh, uh, other projects that are in flight that are dependent, that, that doing that maneuver at that time would put their alpha milestones at, in jeopardy. And so everything was pushed out. And so that, that just, this has made the 3-4 activity uh, drag on too long and waste waste resources in my opinion we, we, we would have been better to wait even starting the 3.4 work on the kernel feature team until there the, until there was a hard agreement on, on when the organization would migrate but I made an assumption and that's what you get when you make assumptions sometimes um, so uh, try not to I'll try not to do that next time. Um, some of the problems with kernel migration that, that you get that we've had is, you know, we have a thousand patches to old baseline. We have backports intermingled, in, intertwined in with these thousands of patches, and it's all single-threaded 
develop, branch development that's really pretty much impossible with rebase. It's just it's it's taking Git and making it CVS basically, and 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 that's what you get with uh, these integration trees basically, and continuous integration. So, <coughs> Um, it's just kind of a side effect of using continuous integration methodologies, really. Um, and uh, you'll have patches that change both new driver code that was added to the kernel and code that it was files that were existing in the upstream kernel. And and every change, you know, most of those changes are are uh, have a high risk of merge conflicts when you get updates. Um, you know, driver teams don't care. We know that. Um, and um, they already said it takes two months. Oh, after okay. So, and so it takes two months for the kernel feature team to get a get a kernel ready for the rest of the organization to start working on, and then when the rest of the organization finally jumps on board, it takes them another one to two months to get to, you know, recover back to an alpha or you know it depends on your definition, uh, an alpha or beta quality, that is actually less, less lower than what they had before. So it takes them, you know, about two months to recover from this stuff. And uh, those two months are spent, you know, basically involving the entire organization at this point. So now it's not just the feature team working. It's, it's you know, hundreds of, it's not this, the kernel feature team doing it. Now, now, now we're talking real money. Um, this is, uh, I've already said these, yeah, we've, software stack, uh, did I talk about test blockers yet? Let's see, ba -ba 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 -ba. no, I, that, that's later. Uh, another problem, you know, uh, from program management point of view, oh yeah, yeah, there's test blockers. Yeah, so another thing that just drives me nuts is, so you're mo moving to a new kernel, it's important to be able to build your, your OS stack on top of that new kernel. Um, and uh, for the, for the 3.0 migration, it used to be that a whole bunch of user mode components would not compile if I dropped a new kernel into the tree. And so I would, I would um, that was, I made a big stink about that. And so on the 3.4 kernel, that's, that's fairly cleaned up. I didn't have any trouble with, with it on the 3.4. But, but from 2.6.35 to 3.4, a lot of core subsystems would not even compile when I dropped a three, the 3.0 kernel into the, into the build because they were assuming locations for header files and they were reaching into the kernel tree for include files. And uh, it, it was just so bad. Um, and, uh, but that got cleaned up. So. But still today for the 3.4 kernel, we'll have certain, certain drivers, usually it's graphics, that they'll change a header file and then it'll either break, it'll break the build or it'll break the runtime uh, and so you won't be able to test and we'll end up with test blockers on the, on the new kernel and that, that makes, it very hard, makes it even harder to migrate to a new kernel. So we want to try to avoid the test blockers. Uh, let's see. So put, put another way, my work environment is we've got a single threaded, single branched tree and it's not manageable. Um, our hardware really can't even boot on an upstream, boot enough on the upstream kernel to make upstream co kernel contributions. Um, and uh, moving to a new kernel means revisit, retesting, potentially retesting thousands of bug, bugzilla reports. Um, and uh, most of the workforce isn't really concerned about this. They're focused on the current product, not the next kernel. Um, yeah, so, so here we are, we have customers saying you got to come out with a once a year hardened long term support kernel. Um, I think that it's supposed to come out, I think after, after, after this experience with our current 3.4, it's going to be planned rollout in Q4, which I think will be great just to have it planned and, 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 and stuck to, as opposed to ad hoc and do it when you're forced. Um, uh, we, have a, we have an organization that has difficulty working in multiple currents concurrently, uh, and uh, uh, upstream first isn't happening, and uh, our ability upstream is, is limited. Jeez. 
I got 15 minutes, huh? Okay. Um, everyone knows how Linux is developed, uh, roughly. So there's a decentralized development. We got many. Everyone's got their own tracking branch, and when you're ready, you rebase your work onto the current tips, and you send a pull request. Um, and then the, the subsystem maintainer you sent the pull request to pulls it, does some code review, maybe does a compile review, and then he sends a pull request to Linus somewhere sometime in the future. And the, the cycle time for doing a, for, for this happens on about a one-week one, one schedule. You know, you can turn on new RCs about once a week. Um, and uh, uh, so it's not really amenable. This, this sort of process of, of, of uh, having a single, a single kernel maintainer kind of gets, conflicts a little bit with continuous integration because uh, well, once a week is too slow. You know. um, also, uh, we're you know, Linux kernel is volunteer-based testing on the master branch. No serious, limited serious organized testing actually happens. And the hardening really gets done on the stable branch. So the key questions to ask is, uh, you know, for, for me, the key questions that, that are going through my mind, are we look, are we do, you know, are, are we just looking at this wrong? Um, you know, how can, how can we, how can we use uh, uh, kernel versioning more effectively with respect to new features? You know, for example, um, rather than backporting you know, a big chunk of video for Linux or, or, or some other kernel feature. Maybe we should just wait and, you know, have an intercept for that new feature with a new kernel. Um, maybe. Um, but, but, you know, uh, we, we should be thinking a little bit more about backports and how we, you know, should we do the backport or should we just go to a new kernel? And uh, um, how can we how can we enable how can we better integrate new uh, multiple kernels into our continuous integration process, which is something that that that's what I'm working on. One of the things I'm working on now, because um, if I can if I can unblock concurrent kernel, you know, have a have a uh, a next kernel integrated with the continuous integration process and getting tested as we go, then by the, we can get a new kernel brought up and, and, and uh, develop uh, confidence in it months before we do the switchover. And uh, um, the other thing is how can I isolate concurrent kernel development uh, activity from the driver and integration teams who, who can't deal with it? You know, is there a way we can, is there a way I can emulate tracking branches um, such that the feature teams don't have to deal with it, and uh, the only then the and only the kernel people who know how to deal with tracking branches can deal with the tracking branches. Um, you know, how can I isolate the core? Can you, can we isolate changes made to core kernel from uh, new kernel additions? And uh, can we isolate backports? And can we um, can we just reduce the time? To, you know, it takes to move to new kernels. So now uh, I'm going to talk about some of the some of the techniques and some of the things. Um, also, uh, you need to have a so you want to have a prior to, you want to have a priority prioritization of what you want upstream uh, and what upstream work you do. Um, uh, you want to dis you know I want to try to disallow touching having changes go into the tree that that in one commit you touch both upstream code and non upstream code because uh, those changes are hard to deal with with respect to uh, merge conflicts. Um, uh, you want to try to use merge com merge commits for backports. So whenever you're doing a backport, you don't cherry pick the backport into the main tree. You cherry pick it into uh, a branch. Um, and then you do a merge commit of the backport from the backport branch. That way, when you move to a new kernel version, you just drop the backport branch. You don't, you don't re have to deal with it. Um, you, try, you, you probably should consider having only, only allowing the kernel tree touch code that is um, 
non-driver that is existing code in the kernel. Um, letting the feature teams and the driver teams and the integration team mess with that code is leads to par, uh, undocumented changes that are hard to migrate and done in a bad way, in, in, in a questionable manner sometimes. Um, you want to make changes to any header files uh, painful. Um, when someone changes a header file, that is a, that is a, a from, from my perspective, you change a header file, you're, you're changing an interface specification, and that will cause, that is, that is the main, that is the root cause of most of the test blockers when you're moving to a new kernel. So if you're in the middle of bringing up a new kernel and someone changes a head, header file on the older kernel for some reason so that they can add an ioctal or something, um, that will result in, has a high probability of a be, becoming a test blocker for the new kernel. And you, you don't want test blockers on your new kernel that's under the development. Um, you want to demand that the user mode, the whole stack builds independently of the kernel so you can drop in a new kernel and not have build time troubles. Uh, and you want to isolate your, you want to, you know, as best you can, you want to try to isolate sources of code flux from the kernel tree if you can. And this, this means moving drivers that aren't, aren't ready for upstream or not even you know, non-upstream drivers that the kernel, that the different feature teams are just hacking away at. Make them hack away at their, their driver outside of your kernel tree, you know, as much as you can. I, I know that a lot of people don't like external driver modules because, you know, it's more files to deal with. It's nicer to have a single monolithic kernel and everything built into it, but it, it, it's just such a problem having thousands of changes to your ISP driver or something and, and trying to migrate that to a new kernel and being able to say, oh yeah, I have all the bug fixes and all the features from the old one. It, it, it becomes hard if, if it's all in the same tree. If you put that in a separate tree, you can do it um, more reasonably. Um, Okay, a little more detail on those, those things and what to do. Oh. Um, you want to, okay, so from my per perspective, my upstream goals are I want the upstream kernel to be able to boot, uh, be able to boot, the, um, boot my platforms to at least a working RAM disk with a serial console, RAM, disk, RAM disk console. I want to have working P and C states uh, and, and suspend a RAM. Uh, uh, working DDFS and, and low power idle states and, and suspend, suspend a RAM. I want those working. Uh, I also want to have the persistent storage working so that I can uh, actually you know, put an OS image on the EMMC and, and, and do the next step. And then I also want a working USB gadget because I'm, I'm dealing with an Android stack here. And nobody, you, you can't get out of the blocks with the feature teams unless they can use ADB. So um, that is what I want upstream at this point. I don't care about little 200 line drivers. Those don't help me. This would help me. So this is the priority for, for right now, what we want upstreamed. And so that's where we're going to put effort. Um, you want to, another, you know, like, like I said earlier, uh, you want to prevent people from touching in the same commit touching both upstream and non-upstream code because that results in merge conflicts. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, another part of our, well, I'll mention it later in, in one of the slides, it's a kind of a graph. But uh, in our process, what we do is we have, um, uh, periodically we, we merge in from Linux stable. So, and uh, if, you're, if you're touching, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're if your driver has to touch an upstream file and you know, a non-upstream file in the same commit, and there's a merge conflict, it makes it hard for me to revert that change so that I can get my, my uh, merge done. So I want to revert the conflicting problem one, is what it, normally I like to do, and then fix it up later, after it. So, and touching code that doesn't belong to you, it, it's, it's, it's not terribly cool, unless you up upstream it and you know what you're doing. And, and 
if you have to touch it, then that's, uh, that's another maintenance point that you need to account for. And if you do it in an ad hoc manner, uh, that results in something, you know, a high probability of a surprise when you go to a new kernel, you know, somebody will say, oh, this, you, my ioctal doesn't work. Why didn't you port my ioctal over? Well, it's because I didn't know you had it there because you hit it in your, in your, in this um, haystack. Turns out it's not as easy as I hope to prevent this. Um, I, I, we, we put in a, uh, made a modification to check patch to, to check to see if the patch uh, touched, a co touched a file that was part of the original baseline that we started with, and if it was, if it was touching that and a file that wasn't in that set, it would, you know, throw up an error, and uh, and uh, um, that caused that caused problems with respect to the um, uh, some energy management drivers that needed to at modify header files that were common, uh, but we really need to get back to you know, we need to change the integration process so I can at least have a warning and, that, and have a process where, where that violating this policy is, it can be approved conditionally. But, you know, like I said, we're using BuildBot for our merging. And it's actually controlled by BuildBot. So um, I need to work with the BuildBot guys to uh, add, add the flexibility to uh, uh, treat check package warnings uh, in a manner that allows us to, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, acknowledge the warning and ignore it. Um, um, backports. This is something that worked good for me this year. So in the 3.0 kernel, you know, we, in, in the 335 kernel we had, we had so many terrible backports. M m just, it was, it was bad. And, and so for the 3.4 three, three, kernel, the way we're doing it now is, uh, if you have to do a backport, um, you have to do the backport, ask the kernel feature team to merge this backport into a special backport branch that had a common baseline with the, with the main branch. And then from there, outside of the BuildBot uh, continuous integration process, it gets merged into the mainline tree. And this way, all the backports are done on merge, merge commits as opposed to inlined with the rest of the stuff. And it, and it, and it really cleans up the history a, a significant amount. If you, if you got a lot of backports, I, I encourage this, this methodology. Um, uh, well, here, here's the branch. So here was, here, this, was the, this is what we tried to implement for 3.0. And everything here is actually correct, except for this, this upstream branch. That's, that's the second one from the top. So I'll just go through these things real quick. Um, the the uh, main branch at the top, that's the main integration branch. That's the one that gets all the testing attention, all the developing t development attention. The next one was supposed to be changes to upstream, upstream files and uh, they were supposed to be segregated from the rest of the main branch, so that you know these these any changes to this uh, origin 3.0 upstream were candidates for uh, changes that should be submitted upstream to the Linux kernel. And uh, then, of course, the backports. I just told you about the backports. Um, but in practice, this upstream one it didn't work as well as as I hoped. And, and I'm going to come back this year and I'm going to try it again. But uh, the backport. That worked great. I recommend that. Um, so the way it works is, when we started the 3.0 branch uh, tree, when we started, we started with, with uh, the Linux stable tree we, and the uh, Android 3.0 uh, branch. We merged those together, and that created our baseline. And so everything is, has a common, common origin, common ancestor in the baseline. Um, then we create our backports, and that's where we do our backports. You know, for example, the um, I backported the uh, uh, Dave Howell's uh, signed driver modules things, you know, last month, and uh, um, so I did it in the backports. And we have some video for Linux stuff backported in there. And um, and recently I did the ACPI backport into our three, well, for 3.4 backport branch, not these, not 3.0. I didn't 
go that far. Um, and uh, then, so you do your changes in these. These, if you're not doing, if you're not, if you're changing your own driver files, do it in your main, in the main branch. But if you're doing a backport, you have to do it special and go through a different process. And I really want to do the same thing and enforce it for changes to the upstream, the upstream kernel, uh, the upstream branch. Um, this year, hopefully, it'll do better. Um, yeah, so you want to make it hard for pe feature teams to change upstream code. So whenever they, ch you know, they, 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 there's everything's a nail to these guys. You know, um, uh, you know, if they're if they're kernel people doing the work, they want to change the kernel. If they're user mode people, they'll, they they want to change user mode. Um, you know they'll 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 make changes where they're they they're more comfortable rather than knowing the you know a a more reasonable a more correct way of doing the change. There's no one right way to do it, so I don't want to say the right way to do it, but there are better ways to do it. But people are biased by their their skills and their aptitudes and their experience. So um, you know. If a feature team needs to add something, sometimes they'll try to hack something crazy into the kernel because they don't want to have to do it in user mode, you know, or 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 vice versa. I've seen terrible hacks try get pushed into the kernel that should have been done in user mode, and I've seen the exact same thing done in user mode, and said, so, "Geez, why didn't you do that in the kernel? <laughs> we can we can do that different." And so anyway, you but. To try to address half of that problem, you want to make it harder for feature teams to touch upstream code. So let them go nuts on their stuff, but don't let them be uh, screwing around with upstream unless, unless if, if you can avoid it. You want to make header changes expensive because changes to a header is a change in an interface specification, and it will it. All, every time I have a, a test blocking issue moving to a new kernel, it's because some joker changed a header file. So, you know, you want to make header files cost more. Um, you want to make sure that user mode doesn't give you any, your, your build doesn't give you any um, test blockers. Uh, so, make sure your tree, your, your user mode can build with, with whatever kernel you feel like. Um, Basically, uh, uh, it's a pain. Let's see. And then um, I'm running out of time, so I'm sort of rushing. <laughs> and I really wanted to uh, make make a pitch for this out of tree driver thing. Um, so, our, the the auditing problem, you know, accounting for all the bugs, the bugzillas that were fixed or addressed on the old drivers, and making sure those are still addressed on the new driver, is is partially addressed if we can have the old, all the if we have the drivers developed in the, in a in their own out of kernel uh, git tree, mm -hmm. and then inside that git tree, the kernel feature team can maintain tracking branches of whatever fix up needs to happen to the driver so it works on the new kernel, and so if we, with that sort of model, at any given time, uh, the 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 new the driver for the new kernel has all the changes associated with the old kernel in there by definition, and all you have to do is put the fix the fix up code on top of it to make sure it, it works with the new kernel. And uh, I, I really think that has a chance of addressing uh, a part of the a significant part of the auditing problem, and it also gets uh, a lot of the code flux uh, out of my kernel Git project, which is. It's like uh, it's a twofer, in my opinion, um, it, and and it also solves the problem of having driver teams that really can't deal with multiple branches and and dealing with Git rebase from actually having to do any know it and deal with it. So um, I don't have to ask them to port their driver. I, I I'll, I'll you know I'm. It, it's already you know I just have to fix my my tracking branch. For each one, and 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 go, and they don't have to know about it, which I think would be good. Um, so, in, in in practice, 
having separate Git project, projects is really kind of analogous, is, is functionally equivalent to uh, having tracking branches and then doing the rebases. I'm just turning it around. Rather than rebasing the drivers on top of the new kernel, I'm rebasing the uh, new kernel glue logic to make the old driver work on the new kernel. And so I'm kind of turning, trying to turn the problem around a little bit. And that, by doing that, I believe I can avoid having the feature teams uh, have to be competent enough to deal with Git rebase. And, 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 and test multiple kernels. We can isolate that work to uh, just the kernel feature team. And I mentioned the auditing problem. And so in theory, if, if, I, if all these things work, I can reduce my time to market. So in summary, we're pretty much pretty close to out of time. Um, upstream first doesn't really work for device, hardened devices. Um, you need, you know, you need to prioritize your upstream efforts, uh, you know, based on time to market and reducing cost of kernel migration. Uh, you need to avoid changes that touch both upstream and non-upstream code concurrently, um, at least in the same patch. Uh, try to use merge commits on backboards. You try to use merge commits for changes to, you know, core kernel code or upstream code, so that you can have more natural auditing of what needs to be pulled forward. Uh, uh, make sure that user mode always builds independently of a kernel version, because you don't want test blockers based on compiling, and uh, you don't want test blockers based on header files either, so make header file changes painful or expensive. And uh, um, try to isolate non-upstream drivers from the, from the main kernel train, uh, main kernel tree into different Git projects. And um, this is actually kind of an experiment. I really think it's going to work, but we'll, we'll, we'll see this next year, how, how, it, how it shapes up. Um, OK, sorry I was talking. There's a lot to say I wanted to say. So, um, like when you talk. What's that? You like it when you talk. Oh, do you? Ah. <laughs> That's why you're here. Oh, yeah. Woo. So we got what? How much? We got probably f maybe five minutes for. Qu we get we got time for maybe one or two questions. And then we gotta let the other guy in. Yeah. So what happens when one of your out of tree kernel drivers decides they want to actually upstream? Well, then it then it then it moves into then we move it in. Okay. It goes it, then then it'll, it ac actually it'll move in as a backport. So they, if, if, they, if, if let's say, uh, uh, I don't know, let's say a camera driver. The camera driver, they, they upstream their camera driver to 2638 or something. Then what I'll do is I'll backport 2638 into my backport branch. <laughs> but I'll backport that driver into a backport branch in my 3.0, I mean 3.4. What do we get back from backports is relatively And then you add, then you add features, and then it gets. I know. Yeah. I got the stop sign. I don't know. You're right. You're right. Don't mind me. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That is a problem, but fortunately or unfortunately, feature teams don't get paid for upstreaming. <laughs> so I'm not sure when that problem's going to become. Um, you know, terribly important. Yeah? Uh, what are your expectations or requirements from the feature teams for test cases for their code? Uh, the feature teams are... Automated test cases? Yeah, they, 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 the, each feature team has a responsibility for uh, doing their... I don't actually levy, get to levy uh, requirements on the feature teams. The, the feature teams have, have a requirement to do their own test uh, automation and test cases, um, but I don't have... In, uh, no, I really can't run there. I can I can run the integration tests, the automated tests set up by the by the by the main integration team. But the individual feature teams, they have their own test suites and their own test harnesses and and environments. Some of them, a lot of them, require specialized equipment to do run their tests anyway. So. Probably need to take any initial questions off the wall. All right. Okay. Got it.